would the original first century audience of the book of Revelation, would they have understood what the mark of the beast was? Now, many people, just given how they look at the book of Revelation as a whole, how they interpret it and things like that, many people would readily say, no, they wouldn't have had any idea what the mark of the beast was. We do today, but they wouldn't have in the first century. I'm going to say, absolutely, of course they knew what the mark of the beast was. Um, now, how do I come to that conclusion? Well, it, it stems from a lot of things that I've explained before, but we'll even get, in, get into the greater details about the mark of the beast, how I believe it should be understood in the book of Revelation, and even how it speaks to us today. Now, I'm going to start to develop this because we're going to take this into two parts. So we're going to take this episode and then the next episode to finish up Revelation chapter 13. I think it's been a a wonderful, profitable uh, study, um, at least I think so anyway, and I hope that it's the same for you. Um, and this is part, of course, this is part of our larger study um, of the book of Revelation. So some good things in store. I hope you stay with us. My name is Steve Gill, and you're listening to Loving the Scriptures. Yeah, so I would be one who said who would say that of all of the things that that can be misunderstood or misinterpreted in the Bible, or even more narrowly in the Book of Revelation, um, I think the mark of the beast is one of those things. And so, um, this is going to be, I think, a, a somewhat of an important um, uh, topic to discuss, um, just because I think that. There are there is a great deal of misunderstanding, misinterpretation, um, you know, just on what the mark of the beast is, um, what it's you know what it's supposed to signify, what it's supposed to represent, um, and you know how it you know again I, I mentioned before even how something like this speaks to us today, or even does it speak to people in the first century? Now, of course, if if I if my whole understanding is is that the people of the first century understood what the mark of the beast was, then of course something like this, something would have been spoken to them in that day. And it's not just for a future generation um, that would be living through a a, um, a, a seven year tribulation period. Um, so we're going to we're going to start to dive into that a little bit. But before we get into the specifics of that, I think you know, you know, ladies and gentlemen, what time it is. It is time for my shameless plug, yes, of course, of my book, Signs of the End. Um, what did Jesus say about his own return and the events that point to it? Um, by me, Steve Gill. You can order it on Amazon.com, um, BarnesandNoble.com. Um, and we encourage you to, um, to, to order a copy. Um, and like I said, I think I've mentioned this before. Um, is that the book is, I think, is, is, is especially good to go alongside with this podcast um, in, 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 you know, just kind of as we explore certain things, because I think that there are, because the book doesn't, is, let me just say this, the book isn't a, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> the book is, <clears throat> my goodness, excuse me, the book isn't um, uh, a, a, a comprehensive look at end times. Um, or eschatology. It covers a lot of features of it, but really the, the, the idea of the book is to interpret Jesus' words to his disciples on the, um, on the Olivet Discourse. And there are certain things that Jesus mentions and talks about that, you know, that are, are worthwhile to, to look into, obviously. But there are other things, as far as our understanding of eschatology, that Jesus doesn't really go into a great amount of detail on. Now, I do go into some detail, some detail as far as the book of Revelation and how we should look at the book of Revelation and interpret the book of Revelation and how that should affect the way that we interpret passages such as the millennium in Revelation chapter 20. And I spent a great deal of time uh, uh, talking about that simply because, you know, when you, when you look at Jesus's words in the Olivet Discourse, and then taking it from the perspective that I take it from, I mean, the the, the question inevitably inevitably gets asked. Well, what about the millennium? Well, I I, I go into detail about that, but um, there are certain things in this study of Revelation that maybe isn't covered as much, um, uh, you know, as it would as you would find in the book, and vice versa. 
So um, all that to say, I think it would be a good idea. I mean, it's a good idea anytime, but I mean, especially now if you're a faithful listener to this podcast um, and if you're looking to get certain questions answered, I think the book will, will be very helpful um, in, in maybe answering some of those questions and uh, giving us a, a, a clearer understanding of how to look at uh, future events and present events, okay? Um, while it does deal with future things, I mean, this has bearing on on the present as well and how we should under, understand things in the here and now. And I think that that's vitally, vitally important for us to understand. So the, the book goes into that as well. So Signs of the End, What Did Jesus Say About His Own Return and the Events That Point to It by me, Steve Gill. Again, you can get that on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, you can go to my Twitter page. I have a link pinned um, at the top of my profile page. Just click on that, and it'll, t- and it'll send you directly to the Amazon page um, for my book. So, um, yeah, go ahead and order a copy of that. Um, I, I, I'm I confident that if you do and if you read it, you won't be disappointed. Okay. So, um, The Mark of the Beast. Um, this, Like I said, this is, this is one of those areas um where there's a lot of uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to say unified understanding but there's there's a large collective understanding for many people as far as how we are to look at this whole thing as uh, regarding the mark of the beast and a lot of you might be familiar with the way that a lot of people understand the mark of the beast um you know growing up um, and even to, and even today, this isn't something that's necessarily gone away or has faded away. But you know, you, you know, people think about Mark of the Beast. They think of uh, they think of six six six, which is not how you say that number. It's not six six six. It's six hundred and sixty six. Um, I will explain that next episode why that's six hundred and sixty six and not six six six. I'm not being uh, unnecessarily nitpicky. There's you no know, the number is six hundred and sixty six, and there's a reason for that not 666, but, um, you know, they think 666, they think uh, demonic, um, occultic uh, sort of things. A large number of people, whenever they think of the mark of the beast, they think of um, a, uh, a, a, a some sort of chip or some sort of barcode or some sort of tattoo um, that somebody's going to get on the hand or on the forehead, um, you know, something that, you know, somebody will be able to scan or, or, or something like that. Um, there's, there's a, and it's, it's just really, it's, it's just really an interesting, I, I, I haven't really done a deep dive in trying to unearth the, uh, the history of the development of, of that understanding of the mark of the beast. Um, all I know is that it, it it's clearly comes from a certain way of viewing and understanding the book of revelation that would say that. You know, you, you know, you look at the things in that book and you see it exclusively as a future sort of thing. So in other words, the mark of the beast wasn't anything that was around in the past. Um, it was, it's not anything that's a thing now in the 21st century or even between the first century and now. It's just solely something that's connected to something future, um, during a seven year tribulation period. And because, we live in the here and now, and we think, and and a lot of people look at Revelation in a futuristic sort of sort of way. Um, they take things in the here and now as far as technology, um, uh, you know, uh, inventions and things like that, and you know, asking themselves the question: How would you know with the things when, in Revelation and how they're written? How are we to understand things now in the here and now so that it makes sense to us? And so I think. Really, when it comes to the mark of the beast, and especially with the widespread understanding that it's some sort of barcode or some sort of tattoo or emblem that's that's tattooed or stenciled or branded on the hand or the forehead, you know, when it comes to that sort of thing, I think maybe what my guess would be um, would be that it started out as speculation. You know, the, you know, if we look at this from a from a futurist point of view. And we we look at this as if in a future point of view, and then we ask ourselves, what would this have looked like? Um, maybe it looks like this, or maybe it looks like that. So it started out as speculation, but as time went on, perhaps it started to become more and more thought of as this is actually how the mark of the beast is going to be applied 
uh, to people in the future in the seven year tribulation. Or, I mean, I guess maybe with even some people, how it can be applied to people today. I mean, you have people speculating is the mark of the beast coming up right before our eyes. I saw a, I saw a, a, a Twitter post not too long ago, um, uh, with a link to an article talking about, um, uh, the, uh, uh, like a like a some sort of a, a a chip of some sort that would be inserted into the hand um, that would house the information on a person's uh, vaccination status, and so the idea of the post was like, hey, this sounds very much like the mark of the beast, you know, and and, and that sort of thing. And and truth be told, actually taking away anything having to do with any sort of microchip or barcode or anything like that. You do have some people who have looked at the vaccines themselves, the COVID vaccines, as the mark of the beast, or at least the vaccines themselves as being like questioning, could this be the mark of the beast? And again, I think a lot of people, they let their imaginations run wild and speculations run wild um, to the point that there are some people, maybe it's not a great number of people, but a good number of people. Who look at the you know everything with the vaccines and they say I think that this is the mark of the beast, and we need to be very careful. So don't take the vaccine, whatever you do, blah 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 blah. And I know that some people have other reasons for not taking the vaccine, but I mean I think spiritual elements, especially connected to the Book of Revelation, um, can explain some people's uh, um, thoughts on the vaccine. And so and it and it gets so much to the point that. I think when you have, because here, here's, here's some things that I've encountered. I've encountered on Twitter, you know, some posts here and there where somebody will post, Hey, my friend or my husband or some close family member, you know, whoever, um, broke down and, and got the vaccine. And then you see these, re read these replies to those posts is saying, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Um, I'll pray for him. You know, that, that sort of thing. It's just kind of like, Okay, I, I don't think it's that big of a deal. And and you can tell from the post that it's that it's taken from a uh, from the spiritual perspective as if, you know, if you take the vaccine, somehow you've broken faith in some way. And it's almost seen as if it's tantamount to taking the mark of the beast so that when somebody gets a vaccine for covid to them, it's a big deal. And they've compromised their faith and that sort of thing. And that's why you have people who are of like mind in that area replying to posts like that saying, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. I'll pray for him, blah, 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 blah. And it's just like, can we just kind of can we just kind of slow down on this whole thing here? I, the the vac Listen, the vaccine is not the mark of the beast. I can tell you that with much confidence. Um, now, that's not to say that you can't have certain opinions about the vaccine, whether you should take it, whether you shouldn't take it. I have my own uh, opinions about the, about the vaccine uh, myself uh, that runs in agreement with with some people and in, in disagreement with other people. I mean, as far as the vaccines themselves, uh, the COVID vaccines themselves, if you if you're a Christian and you got the vaccine, that's great. I hope it works for you. I don't I don't look at it as something like, oh, my goodness, you've compromised your faith or somehow you've taken the mark of the beast and that sort of thing, whatever. If you're on the other side and say that I don't want the vaccine, um, I think that it can potentially harm people, blah, 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 um, that sort of thing. Um, that's great, too. You know what? You, you know, a lot of people and even Christians have made have made a, a have made a big deal about the vaccine. Myself, you know, just my own opinion. I don't give a hoot. OK, if you got the vaccine, that's great. If you don't want to take the vaccine, that's your choice, too. At the end of the day. I don't care. It, I really, I really don't. Um, I, I really don't care. So uh, I, that that makes it obvious that I don't think that the vaccine um, is the mark of the beast. Um, everybody has their own opinion. Now, I'm not anti-vaccine. It's up. It's it's up to it's up to you. It should be up to you anyway. I am against vaccine mandates. So this push by the by the federal government to force people. Uh, to take vaccines that I am not a fan of. Okay. That I am not a fan of. I will say that for sure. Um, and a lot of people, whether vaccinated or unvaccinated feel the same way. Um, so, so yeah, let's just, let's just, I mean, just in starting to discuss this whole thing with, with the mark of the beast, can we just at least agree together not to connect things like the COVID vaccine to the mark of the beast, the, the vaccine, it, that's not it. 
Okay. That is not it. The vac, the COVID vaccine, whatever you think of it, whatever your opinion is of it, it is not the mark of the beast. Okay. Can we, can we at least agree on that? And hopefully by the time we end this discussion on the mark of the beast, you'll understand why. You'll understand. Oh yeah. Okay. That's kind of silly to think that, that the vaccine is, is the mark of the beast. Um, and especially I'll, I'll tell you now, especially given what we've seen in Revelation 13 and the religious overtones. Um, of this, the religious overtones having to do with those people who are connected to the beast. Those are the inhabitants of the earth, i.e. unbelievers and those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So we see that the that the the line of demarcation here in Revelation chapter 13 is between believers and unbelievers. And you have one group of people whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. And what do you see them doing? You see them worshiping the beast. And that's not what people whose names are written in the book of life. That's that's what one thing that you don't see them doing is worshiping the beast. Now, I think as it comes, as it relates to the mark of the beast, people who take the so-called mark of the beast. And again, we'll get into all of what that is and how the first century audience would have understood it to mean, um, you know, the you know, this whole thing that with the with people of the earth getting the mark of the beast. This is a whole thing that. I believe the inhabitants of the earth, unbelievers, people whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, they would have no qualms in in, in getting a mark. Or, it, and I got to be careful with how I word things here because I'm I'm trying not to make it sound like these are people who are voluntarily going to a place and getting something on their hand and forehead and saying yes, okay, mark me up. I don't think that that's the way that it works. Although I think that that's how a lot of people imagine it to be. I kind of think of um, the 1972 film um, uh, Thief in the Night. I know that I've made references to that movie here and there uh, throughout our study of, uh, of Revelation. And that, and that movie is, is – and the other sequels, there's three other movies that are sequels to that, um, is definitely from a, from a dispensational premill, premillennial um, perspective on that. And one thing, if you're, if you're familiar with the movie, if you've seen the movie and if you remember from that movie – um, the whole thing of the mark of the beast, you know, it was some sort of um, emblem or something that was that was uh, branded on somebody's hand or on their forehead. Now, here's the one thing. This is kind of a side note. It's not that important, but it's something that that I never really understood <laughs> is that okay, it, it, as it's as it's portrayed in the movie, um, you know, the rapture has already happened and you have these people who are lined up at these at the Unite, um, you know, uh, identification centers where people are, are are getting this mark, the mark of the beast. And of course, from scripture, it says that you get the mark of the beast on your hand or on your forehead. And so um, the um, the thing is, is that, you know, when people go in to get the to get the mark, they're given a choice um, on the hand or on the or on the forehead. And the scene is it, it, the scene to me is somewhat comical because it's kind of very deadpan. And I don't know if it's the way the script was written or if that's just a product of bad acting. Uh, but you know, you have this scene where you have um you have this you have this woman sitting across from this guy and the guy's like, you know, on the hand or on the forehead. You know, it's kind of, kind of very serious, very demeanor. And he kind of sounds like that. You don't want to know mark on your hand or on your forehead. And uh, the woman's like, "Can I wash it off?" He's like, "No, it's permanent." And she and she sits and thinks about it for 30 seconds. And then she says on the back of the hand. And I think, why do you need to even think of that? Think about that. If it's permanent, why in the world would you want to get it on your forehead? Get it on the back of your hand. If you're going to get the mark, get it on the back of your hand if it's permanent, not on your forehead. And what's interesting is that once she gets stenciled on the or branded on the on the hand, she gets up and then the next person in line is this is this old dude. And he sits down and he points to his forehead. He's like, mark me up. I'm not afraid to be a good citizen. And, uh, you know, and so his choice was on the forehead. And again, I think, you know, the whole thing, why would you want to get that on the forehead if you're going to get the mark? It just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. But. You know, here's the question. I mean, speaking of that, I mean, we think about the, the mark of the beast. We think of it on the hand or on the forehead. And, um, you know, we think, OK, this is, you know, at least from the perspective of the people who made that movie, which, again, is obviously from a premillennial dispensational perspective. They think that this is something that's going to be a literal marking. Is that really the the case, though? Again, we're going to get into that a little bit, um, a little bit as well. But um 
it's it, I'm going to just going to say something here before we delve into the text. It's going to be very important for us to understand. And I think and this is something that I've that I've mentioned in times past, I know. But it's good to be reminded of this here. And that is, is that when it comes to this passage or even several other passages in the book of Revelation, um, as you well know, it's important for us to interpret this in light of, you know, how the first century audience would have understood this. Now, a lot of things in the first century might not look the same principally today as it did back then. But again, principally, I think we can apply some things. But it's one thing to do that. It's something totally different to put interpretations of the book of Revelation in our 21st century world that would have gone way over the head of the first century audience. And I, and I fear that that's what a lot of people do when it comes to the book of Revelation and even with something like this. So when it comes to the mark of the beast, you know, we assign that as being some sort of barcode um, or some sort of tattoo or microchip or something, um, you know, that's that's put on the on, on the on the hand or on the forehead or something like that, that, you know, it's very technologically sound and something that we understand in the 21st cent. I mean, excuse me, the first century audience would have been like, huh? You know, and, and I'll repeat again. The book of Revelation is a book that's meant to reveal, okay? It's a book that's meant to reveal. So when John is writing this down to the original first century audience, he's not writing things that's that's a total enigma to that first century audience. And in fact, I'm fully convinced that when the book of Revelation is being read to them, that they would have been ones, as they're hearing this read to them, would, would have been ones who said, oh, I know exactly what, what he's referring to. I know exactly what this is referring to. I know ex exactly what this is being communicated to here. But we don't think that the first century audience had a great deal of understanding of a lot of things. And as time and as technology has grown, we're like, oh, we get this here. We understand this, this, and this. And I'm going to be one who says, no, we're the lost ones. The first century audience had the, had would have had a greater understanding. And I think a lot of times in the 21st century, we've kind of mucked it up. And one of the big contributing factors to that is our lack of understanding of the Old Testament. Now, I'll leave it there because I feel like I'm, I'm going extensively on territory that I've covered already. And we don't need to plow that ground again. But again, this is just to set the stage and to set the table so that we can have our minds in the right place, so that we can be in a better position to look at the mark of the beast more accurately. And not look at it as some sort of 21st century technological sort of thing um, or, you know, looking at it, you know, whether that's in the form of a chip or a barcode um, or, you know, again, the COVID vaccine. None of that is the mark of the beat. I mean, I'm, I'm being very bold here when I'm when I'm saying this and being absolute when I'm saying these things. Those things are not the mark of the beast. It's not. Not the mark of the beast. So let's get that in our minds right now. Okay. So, but the term mark of the beast, in order to come to an understanding of what the mark of the beast is, I think it's important for us to ask the question, well, what is the beast? Now, we've talked about this before, um, and it might do you well to go back to that episode um, so that you can, you know, glean, you know, so you, that you can go over again what we what we talked about as far as identifying what the beast is but I'll I'll just say this real quickly in review is that what we saw is that the that the beast is not um a a, a an, an individual um it's not an end times individual i.e. the an end times antichrist figure um and it's not uh you know it's 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 more along the lines of and again we're drawing from places in the old testament and specifically from places like Daniel chapter 7 where, you know, you, it's what you're dealing with there, you know, most of the time is, is, you know, certain features of the four different beasts that represent four different nations in that in that vision in Daniel. And you take cer certain features from that description and they're combined in this description of the beast in Revelation chapter 13. So basically what you're dealing with is a conglomeration of um, of nations um, uh, that make up the unbelieving world that uh, serve as several antichrists that manifest themselves in different ways throughout the throughout human history between the first and second comings of Christ. Okay, that 
operates in a way that goes against God, against Christ, the things of Christ, and against his people. Okay, that's really what we've been what we've been talking about. And then we when we see the emergence of the um, of the second beast, who will later be called the false prophet, um, you see that this second beast points everybody in the direction of the first beast, and using signs and miracles and stuff, including fire coming down from heaven and stuff, to point people to them to give legitimacy to the first beast. And it's from this, and it's from this, the activity of the second beast that we see this whole thing of, um, of uh, the, uh, we see this whole thing of the mark of the beast coming about. Okay, but that's what we see as as it relates to you know things having to do with the 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 beast, uh, the two beasts, the first beast and the second beast. Um, and again, if if you're just joining us now, I would encourage you to go back a handful of episodes. Uh, to when we started our study of chapter 13. I don't think you necessarily have to go and, you know, start at the very beginning of Revelation, although if you wanted to do that, you could. But at the very least, go back to, you know, the, when we started looking at um, Revelation chapter 13 and talking about what the uh, what the beast is um, and start listening to those episodes from there leading up to here. And I think you'll have a greater understanding as you enter into as you enter into this time. Okay. But another thing that we need to that we need to keep in mind here, just as far as giving giving uh, giving us an understanding of, of of what of what the mark of the beast is, is that not only you know uh, reminding ourselves what the beast is, but how the beast um, parodies the things having to do with God. That's part of that's part of its deceptive work. You know, all of this under the under the under the influence of the dragon, who is Satan, right? And with the beast taking the authority of the dragon, i.e. Satan, you know, you see that part of its deceptive work is to do things that make it look godlike. You know, for example, so again, one of the things that you see repeated here and there a few times is the whole thing of 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 the wound. It, you know, it has it has seven heads and one of the one of the wounds of the head um was healed. And that's supposed to parody the whole thing of the lamb back that we saw in Revelation chapter 5 which we understood understand to be Jesus Christ who was uh, who seemed to be slain but was standing and the language and especially in the original language in the original Greek kind of is shaped in the same way and I think that you know to describe the 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 wound of one of the heads that was healed you know it looking as if it had been had been wounded but is now healed it kind of has that sort of thing where it's kind of t- trying to imitate or parody things having to do with Jesus Christ, who was slain and is now standing and is alive, who is resurrected. Um, another area that you see that is is in the way that that people of the earth, the inhabitants of the earth, the unbelievers, worship uh, the beast. Because remember, the people of the earth, those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, those are people who are going to be worshiping the beast. And one of the things that we saw them saying um, was um, in uh, was in verse four, uh, where they're saying who is like the beast and who can fight against it. Now that language is somewhat familiar if you understand that in places in the Old Testament, that's kind of the refrain that the people of God would say, you know, when they're worshiping God, or even how God Himself speaks about uh, speaks about Himself, where He says, "Who is like me?" or some or anybody who's worshiping God saying, "Who is like our God." Um, and that sort of thing. You see places like that in, in the book of Isaiah. You see that in Exodus chapter 15 and in some other places. Again, we, we went over a few examples when we went over that um, in that particular examination of that passage. OK, um, and even when you get to the whole thing of the second beast or the false prophet, the fact that it's a, that it has two horns, um, that's supposed to parody. I think the two witnesses um, that you see the two lampstands, you know, those things that we saw in Revelation chapter 11, which when we were going through that, and as we unpacked the meaning of that, you'll know that I concluded that I believe that the two witnesses represent the church between the first and second comings of Christ. Um, again, if you're wondering about that and you haven't heard that, go back and listen to those episodes as well. I think it's a very uh, worthwhile examination to go back and listen to. Um, but that's, so if we're talking about the mark of the beast, we have to remind ourselves what we're dealing with as it relates to the beast. And the beast is one where, who is being worshiped by the inhabitants of the earth. He's speaking haughty and blasphemous words against God and against the people of God and that sort of thing. And that beast is one who overcomes the saints and conquers them. And even when you look at, at chapter 11, 
when you see the the uh, mentioning of the beast there, you see that you know it, it says the same thing that um, that the beast overcomes the two witnesses and conquers and kills them. That's why I think you see a parallel between what you see with the two witnesses in Revelation chapter eleven and the saints that you see in Revelation chapter thirteen. Okay, so a lot of stuff there, you know, that we're just that we're just throwing out there. But I think again. If we're talking about the mark of the beast, we have to be reminded of those things. Now, as you go, as you get into this whole discussion of the of the mark um, of the beast, um, if you look at, we're just going to look at, at at part of at at verse sixteen and part of verse seventeen, um, and then look at the rest of the passage um, next time in finishing up chapter thirteen of Revelation. But if you look into uh, uh, verse sixteen of this chapter. It's a continuation of talking about what the second, what the second beast, the false prophet, what he does. And this is what it says. Actually, let me go ahead and read verses 16 through 18, even though we're not going to cover all of that. We'll, we'll see that as a whole. Um, no, actually scratch that. Let me just go back and read the whole section. Um, that includes what we looked at the last time we were in Revelation. So in chapter 13, starting in verse 11, last time we were in Revelation, we looked at uh, verses 11 through 15. We're going to look at uh, verses 16 through 18, these next two episodes here. But starting in verse 11, just so that we can get the full picture here, this is what it says. It says, Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image of the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the beast uh, uh, the image of the beast to be slain. Now, here, here's where we get into our part here, where we left off. Verse 16. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. And again, I read that 666 because I believe truly that it, that is the proper way of reading it. It's not 666. But again, as I said, we'll, we'll, I'll explain why, and it'll become more clear when we talk about that actual number next time. But for now, let's just take a look at, you know, if we start uh, looking at verse 16 here. Um, we see the comprehensive nature of, of, of who this affects in this particular vision. Um, we're seeing here, just notice how, how it's described here. In, in uh, Again, if you go back to verse 16, and it says it and also it, i.e. The, the second beast, um, causes all. Now, underline that in your mind. We think all. What do we mean by all? Well, here's the description. Both small and great, both rich and poor, both slave and as well, excuse me, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. Okay, so this really gives us, and and again, this is this is somewhat familiar um, biblical language, um, just as it relates to who this who this covers here. This isn't altogether unusual unusual language. Whenever the Bible writers want to express, uh, you know, the wide scope of who you know of what event who will be affected or touched by a certain significant event. Um, you know, there's ways like this or ways that are similar to this that, that, that shows you that this event or, you know, whatever God has in mind is going to touch a wide range of people, regardless of their social status, their economic status, and that sort of thing. Um, whatever class that they're a part of in, in, in anything. So, you know, you think, for example, um, you know, the, um, when it, when it came to the plagues of the firstborn, for example, um, in, in Exodus, when, you know, as, as that is getting ready to be rolled out, one of the things that scripture says is that it's going to touch the firstborn, uh, it, this is going to affect people from the firstborn, um, of Pharaoh 
uh, who is king over Egypt, to the firstborn of the of the slave who runs the handmill, and the firstborn of the cattle as well. So you see a wide range as far as who this who, uh, who's going to be affected by this plague. Um, save for the Israelites who celebrated the first Passover and put the and put the blood on the doorpost. But I mean, for those who would be affected by this plague, you know, from as high up as Pharaoh to as low as you know, in in the social order, you know, slaves and even of animals as well. So you get this understanding; it, it covers a wide range of people. Um, in the book of Revelation itself, I mean, even if you if you take your minds back to um, Revelation chapter six and the breaking of the sixth seal. Um, remember when that was when that was broken and you had everything going on with the sun, the moon, and the stars and everything, and the the heavy winds and things like that. Um, in verse fifteen of that chapter, it says, "Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful, and everyone slave and free, hid themselves in the caves." You know, so again, you have the generals, you have the kings, you know, the powerful, and then you have both uh, free. And slave, the slaves, you know, kind of being, you know, socially in that time, just kind of, you know, the, the lower class of, you know, of whatever group that you're talking about there. And so you have the same thing. You have the same thing here uh, when it comes to when it comes to Revelation chapter 13. And it seems very widespread. Now, here's the thing, because when we're talking about the mark of the beast, we're talking about people who are being deceived. Remember, that's the whole purpose. And one of the things that we've seen in, in, in episodes past as we've been examining this chapter is that God is one who is allowing this deception to take place. Um, and, you know, those people whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you know, this is this is part of the things that, that you know, part of the consequences that we see in this particular vision is that they're deceived into into worshiping uh, into worshiping this this beast. And remember, everything having to do with the beast and the false prophet has very huge religious overtones, uh, religious overtones that, that draw people towards, um, you know, certain, uh, you know, other religious beliefs, um, anti-God, anti-Christ belief, uh, beliefs, um, and also leads people to reject the truth of scripture, the truth of God, the truth revealed about Christ and reject Christians in general. And again, we've looked at all of this and we've unpacked this and talked about this in detail, um, in past episodes as we've, as we've as we've uncovered this chapter in chapter 13 okay so very large widespread religious deception that's going on here but it's just amazing that when you have that this is a deception that covers a whole range of people which should give us this understanding that it doesn't matter who you are whether you're rich whether you're poor whether you're smart whether you're not so smart um, you know, whether you're somebody in high position or whether you're somebody who's just a regular old dude, um, or a regular old gal, you know, whatever the case may be, whether you're, you're upper class, middle class, lower, you know, whatever the case may be, spiritual deception doesn't discriminate from social class or social standing or educational status or that sort of thing. It, it, it doesn't know, it doesn't distinguish between those sorts of things. Because truth of the matter is, whether you're, you're, you know, where you're talking about slaves versus free, you know, rich versus poor, you know, upper class versus lower class or whatever the case may be. If we're dealing with a group of people whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the from the beginning of, of, of the world, from the foundation of the world, you're dealing with people who being born spiritually dead into this world. Um, are prime candidates for being drawn, or, or actually, I should say, are ones who automatically, by their very unregenerate nat- nature, go against the things of God. They, they're haters of God, according to Romans chapter 1. And it shouldn't surprise us that by their very sinful, unregenerate nature, they go towards things that, are, uh, that go against God, against Christ, and the things of Christ, and the things that the followers of Christ stand for. Okay? So, that's just a spiritual truth as it relates to somebody's spiritual condition outside of Christ. It doesn't matter whether you're educated or uneducated or whether you're upper class or lower class, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you have a PhD or whether you have a GED, right? It doesn't matter. You know, that's, and you know, what's very, very interesting. You, you see this kind of fleshed out in an actual historical um, setting. Um, if you were to look, for example, at, um, 
um, at Acts chapter 8, when it's talking about um, Simon the Magician, um, you remember that whole thing before, you know, you know, when it's talking about uh, Simon the Magician, who was who was cre- doing all sorts of things to, you know, all sorts of magical arts and things like that. Um, and this was before Philip the Evangelist came and, and started doing ministry um, in uh, in Samaria. But the description here in, in Acts chapter 8, if you look, for example, at verse uh, verses 9 through like 11, where it says, But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in, in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying, to, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying this, uh, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. Okay? Now, this is something you, This is something where we look at this and we say, oh, only the people who really don't have a lot going on in the brain, in the head, would, would, would fall for something like this, would be sucked in or deceived by something like this. you got to have a little bit more smarts. Um, than that, you know, or somebody who is of a, of a greater social class would be smart enough not to not to be pulled into things like that. But no, that's not the case when it comes to somebody's spiritual condition. When we're talking about people who are outside of Christ, you know, that knows, you know, that that has nothing to, you know, the, the whole spiritual condition thing. It, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor and everything like that. As this, as this passage says here in chapter eight, from the least of them to the greatest were drawn in by the false magic of Simon the Magician, okay? And so that's what we have here. Um, people whose we've already said whose spirit, what their spiritual condition is. So all of these people, um, those both um, all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both uh, free and slave, um, that's, uh, that's, um, that's who we're dealing with here. Um, now, here's the thing. It, it, it says, as it goes on to say there, um, the beast, the second beast, um, causes them to, uh, still in the middle of verse 16, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. Okay. Now, again, you know, what we have to understand here, um, I, I, you know, there's a couple of things we have to understand. Uh, you know, one having to do with um, how this is even described in places in the Old Testament, because this is, I think, this is something that's drawn from the from you know from the old testament language from the old testament to give the first century readers a little bit of an understanding of what's going on in their present time but also in connection to that in connection to uh, um, in uh, in connection to that what we have to understand is that we have like in connection to that how this would answer the question of whether this is something that is that is, that is literal or whether this is something that's figurative. Now, based on our the, on the study of that that we have of Revelation up to this point, I think you're very much aware if you've been with us in our study up to this point that I believe that much of what we read in the Book of Revelation is symbolic. Now, does it mean that you know it's just all completely allegory and that nothing that nothing in it is true? When we're talking about figures, when we're talking about symbols, when we're talking about allegories here, it's those things are pointing to a reality, pointing to something that's real. So we're giving the we're given the the symbolic pictures here, but they point to something real. The whole thing is what is the reality that the Apostle John is pointing to? That's what we have to understand. And when we draw from our understandings or what should ideally be our understandings of things in the Old Testament and how the first century audience would have understood these things, we were able to answer the question, okay, so when it comes to the mark of the beast, the actual mark of the beast, are we actually really dealing with something that's literal that we put on our literal hand and on our forehead? Or is this something that we're just, that's just, you know, that's just figurative and it's pointing us to another reality that we need to grasp onto so for a greater understanding and for greater clarity. All right. But basically, I think what we're dealing with here for the most part, um, here again is um, another parody between, you know, what is presented with the beast or the mark of the beast and what we see with Christ, God and the things of God. If we're talking about a mark that's somewhat close to or similar to what we've read before as it relates to the people of God, i.e. Christians, believers in Christ being sealed. 
Now, one thing that we, that we learned as it relates to a seal or marking of some sort is that it marks, um, it, it, it denotes, um, possession saying that this thing, whatever is sealed here belongs to this person or, and, or it speaks of protection, you know, something that's sealed, um, is something that is protected by the person who sealed it. Okay. So I think that that is the best way that we should understand um, this sort of thing. This is another parody um, that, we, that we're encountering here. So if you were to look at places, and we don't have to go into great detail on this, but if, you know, for places like 2 Timothy 2.19, where it talks about this, you know, the seal of, you know, God knowing those who are his, that speaks of the possessive aspect um, and the protection aspect, as we saw it laid out in Revelation chapter 7, verse 3. Remember, actually, I do want to turn back and point your attention to this because I think that this is going to be very important for us to understand. Um, but in, and let me just start in verse one here of, of Revelation chapter seven here and then work our way to verse three where it says this. It says, after this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the, of the earth that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from uh, ascending from the rising, uh, excuse me, rising of the sun, with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to uh, to the four angels who had given who had given uh, who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, "Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads." So you get a sense there that there's a protective aspect there as far as the sealing of those people. Now, the people who are sealed, as you go on to read in that chapter, are 144,000 uh, Jews, which if you go back and listen to that episode and, and unfolding that, we understand that that's not a literal uh, number of 144,000 Jews, but that's a representation of the church between the first and second comings of Christ. Again, I know that for some people they're brought up believing things differently. But trust me, I, I explained all of those things in a previous episode. So if you're wondering about that, go back and listen, uh, listen to that episode. But the point being here is that you see an actual ceiling going on here. Okay. And the ceiling, um, at least as we saw it there in Revelation, in Revelation 7, 3, has a protective aspect to it. Okay. And that's what, and that's what we have to, and that's what we have to understand here. Now, we're given a fuller understanding, I think, just as it relates to Revelation 7, 3, of what that ceiling is for believers in Christ, for Christians. Um, and we, we, I think we can safely say that this is something that is, that is true for all Christians, not just for one ethnic group, i.e. Jews or something like that, based on what you see in Revelation chapter 3, verse, uh, verse 12. And again, this is something that we've seen, um, a while back, this is kind of almost a year ago when we were in this section. Um, but in the letter to the church in Philadelphia, in verse 12 of chapter three, it says the one who conquers. And remember when it, when one of the things that we said as part of the pattern of the, of the letters to the, to the seven churches in Asia minor is that when it comes to that, those who conquer section of that letter, what's about to be laid out there are promises that are true, not just of that local church or local assembly in Asia minor, but it's true of all Christians, all believers. And we know that because that same thing is cataloged later in the book of Revelation in the context of all believers. But in, in chapter 3, verse 12, it says, The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of the of the city of my God, the New Jerusalem who comes down from my God out of heaven um, and my own and my own new name. Okay. So the name of the name of uh, the name of my God, uh, the name of, uh, um, as it says there, I'll write on him, the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. Now, if you were to flip over to chapter 14, and obviously this is something we're going to get to really soon because we're almost done with chapter 13, but in chapter 14 of revelation, um, in verse one, um, it says, then I looked and behold, on Mount Zion stood the lamb and with him 144,000. Okay. So there's 144,000 again, 
who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Okay. So there you see that, you know, we're dealing with the same thing here, the name of God written on the foreheads. And this is something that applies again, as we just talked about, is something that applies to all believers. Now, the question is, this seal, and I think that this is very much what we're talking about when when the believers are sealed. Um, and I think if you go even theologically deeper, you see that the sealing is the Holy Spirit. It's pointing to the Holy Spirit. If we're talking about sealed, protected, the seal of protection that's written on the forehead of the believer, are we, is that something that we're to take literally? No. And I, and I don't think that I'd get a lot of argument from that. I can go to a mirror right now, look at the mirror, look in the mirror and see that there isn't God's name literally written on my forehead. It's just not there. But it's symbolic. It's supposed to tell us something. That's what we're supposed to get from this here. Okay? So just as much as the as the name of God being written on our foreheads isn't literal, but it's pointing to a reality that's true of all Christians, we can ask the same thing about the mark of the beast here in Revelation chapter 13. When these people are marked on the right hand or the forehead, is this something that we would actually understand to be literal? I would be one to say that it's it's not necessarily uh, something that we that we see as a as a literal um, as a literal marking on the hand or on the forehead. Now, here's the thing. It says here. Um, oops, I, I turned from. Chapter 13, let me turn back to the text here. Um, it says there, um, um, so that, uh, excuse me, uh, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. So the next question that we, that we could ask is, why the right hand or the forehead? Now, again, I alluded to this before, is that this is drawn from how things were worded in the Old Testament. And if you read the Old Testament and you're familiar with the Old Testament, uh, you might grasp this. Um, and let me just show you a few areas where this is where this sort of thing is um, is laid out. Uh, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter six, um, and this is um, let me start in verse four. But I think the the main thrust here is in verse eight. Um, so in Deuteronomy chapter six, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you and when you lie down and when you rise. Now listen to this, verse 8. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets, frontlets between your eyes. Okay? Now, that language is repeated in a, in a few other places uh, in, in similar fashion. Uh, later on in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18, and you also see it even before then in the book of Exodus, chapter 13, verses 9, and also in verse 16. But even here with what we see, what we just saw in Deuteronomy chapter 6, tie them as signs to your hands and, to, and as frontlets between your eyes. Another way of, of saying, you know, you can put that right between your eyes on your forehead. Now, Many people of the Jews took that literally, and that's where you get the whole thing of phylacteries from. You read about phylacteries in Matthew chapter 23, and those were little boxes that, um, that, had, that had scripture passages from the Old Testament, from the, from the Pentateuch, um, in, you know, tied to a person's wrist or their hand. Um, it was usually on their left hand or left arm or on the forehead. Um, and that's, and, you know, people were taking that literally, they kind of missed, uh, what God was actually trying to communicate there, um, in that whole thing, which I, I guess we should really inform us as far as how we should take the Jews, uh, misunderstanding of that and taking things literally and applying it to even how people see revelation chapter 13 here, just as the Jews and the Jewish leaders back at that time had these phylacteries and kind of missed the whole point of what of what was being said in the Old Testament passages. You know, so I think, you know, if we understand things too literally in Revelation, we miss what's being communicated there. What was God trying to communicate to his people back then in the Old Testament? And why were we talking about tie them to your hands and, you know, as frontlets between your eyes? Because it was supposed to be, you know, the commandments that they were given to obey 
those were things that were supposed to have an effect on on their on their thoughts and their beliefs about God and who he was and it was supposed to affect the way that they live which is symbolized in the hands which you know when we're talking about hands we're talking about doing things with deeds so it came and it comes to thoughts and it comes to deeds forehead hands that's that's really that's really what what is what is being communicated there and really i think theologically there are a lot of people who don't necessarily disagree with that my whole thing is, is that why can't we say that the same thing is being, uh, should be our understanding in Revelation? Because really what we're, what we're talking about in Revelation chapter 13 is a whole thing where people are buying into the system of the beast and it's anti-God, anti-Christian way of going about things and even persecuting the people of God. And even with the with the activity of the second beast and putting them to the first beast and saying this whole thing is legitimate, what does that affect? How does that affect the people whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life? It affects the way that they think and what they believe, and it also affects their deeds as well. And that's really what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is that you, you know, people are, are being told to buy into a belief that takes them away from the, from God, the one true God, Christ, and what Christians proclaim as far as the gospel is concerned and proclaim what they proclaim about Christ. And they go in the other direction. And so much to the point that that belief system causes them to turn and hate the people of God. So much to the point that they are they are, I've used this term before in past episodes as it relates to the people of the earth and the beast, that they are of kindred spirits. They are in agreement with one another. So basically, even with the people of the earth, I don't think what you're dealing with here are people who are standing in line like you see in in movies like The Thief in the Night, who are waiting to get a physical tattoo of some sort on their hand or on their forehead. I don't think this is some due to some sort of, you know, uh, government. Well, it could be a part of a government decree if you're talking about in the first century context of the worship of Caesar. But of, of course, we've covered that territory in the past as well. But really, you're you're not going to get a lot of disagreement from the people of the world in receiving the quote unquote mark. And I say quote unquote because again, we're not dealing with something literal here. But you're having people who are mentally buying into the belief of the beast. In whatever way that it manifests itself in different parts, in different times in human history, in different parts of the world. And it affects the way that they live, which also includes how they go, uh, go out and attack and are against other Christians, other believers. And depending on where you live, that whole thing can, can amount to physical persecution, death, that sort of thing. We talked about that as well in past episodes as well and what that looks like. And especially even what it looked like for the for the Christians in the first century, so that's really so that's really what you're dealing with. And so, on on a, on a I guess you could say even on an opposite uh, perspective on how on how to look at this, if you're talking about people who, you know, on their foreheads or on their hands receive the mark of the beast, which shows that you know their his its possession of them, just as far as them buying into the, the the thoughts, the ideologies that go against Christ and the deeds that go against his commandments and also would results of them going against and persecuting God's people. You know, if you if you if you have that sort of thing as it relates to the hand and the forehead, in an indirect way, and I say indirect because it isn't explicitly laid out in the text here in Revelation 13, you see what this means as far as the hand and the forehead for believers, those whose people whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because our thoughts, our beliefs are connected to Jesus Christ, not the beast. And that belief and that faith and that trust that we put in God affects the way that we live. And because we've been renewed, because we've been regenerated through that belief in the one true God and belief in Christ for salvation of our sins, based on his sacrifice on the cross, we live totally different lives than people of the world. And I don't know if any of you who are listening now have been with us when we were, you know, last year when we were going through um, the study of First Peter. But if you remember, one of the things that I said as we were going through that book is that we, you know, you know, our quote unquote culture, so to speak, just speaking in spiritual terms here, is different from the world system. So that we are the ones that look alien to everybody else in the world. 
because our thought, our thoughts are different. Our beliefs are different. Our behaviors are different. People look at us and saying, you are weirdos. And for some people, depending on how God is working on their heart, that might be a draw for them that draws them closer to salvation. But for other people, it gives them reason to ridicule, revile, and maybe even abuse other Christians. So in an indirect way, we can say that, you know, what we have on our hand and our forehead marks us as people who belong to God. And of course, we do see in a certain sense, we are sealed. We do belong to God, as we've seen in Revelation chapter 7 and even what I previewed there in in Revelation chapter 14. And that results in something that's different than the world system and the world doesn't like it. Because for a lot of people in the world, that's going to serve as a big area of conviction against them and they're not going to like that. Okay. So as this, as you know, as time persists and you see these different manifestations of the beast, remember the people who are inhabitants of the earth are, you know, work hand in hand with the beast. They're of kindred spirits. They believe the same thing. They themselves are anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-Christian. So they're able to, with no problem, look at the people of God and say, we don't like you and may be involved in persecution in whatever form and whatever degree. And you see that you see how that uh, the effects of that even when you go into the first part of chapter uh, excuse me of verse 17 so as we talk about this whole thing of people receiving this mark you know to be marked on the right hand of the forehead verse 17 so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark okay now again this whole thing if we look at this from a futuristic perspective you know, again, this is something that a lot of people see as, as happening during a seven year tribulation where, you know, people before that time or even people in the first century, if they were you know, to look at something like this, you, we imagine that people before this time wouldn't know or couldn't imagine what this would be like if because we don't have some sort of insignia or barcode or, bar or tattoo on our forehead and our hands, we couldn't imagine that, you know, Suddenly, we wouldn't be able to eat. We wouldn't be able to go to the store or anything like that. Again, to to draw your attention back to what I talked about as far as the thief in the night. Remember, uh, you know, when it, there's one uh, scene where it, it shows this this girl who hasn't received the mark yet, and she's trying to go to the store, and there's a sign in the in the door that's that has the symbol, the mark. You know, it's it, it's a mark. I can't describe it. It's you know some uh, some sort of symbol or insignia. And it says that, and it says only those citizens with the mark, you know, whatever, are welcome. So she doesn't have that, so she can't go into the store. And that's what we kind of imagine things to be. And it's very much futuristic. And again, futuristic in the sense that this is something that's only going to, um, that's only going to affect people in a seven year tribulation period. Folks, that sort of thing was going on in the first century. Now, I, I think I may have mentioned this, um, before. And if so, I'll, I'll just be mentioning it again. But when the first century audience here who are hearing the book of Revelation read to them, hear this whole thing is that so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, they understand what that means. Because again, and especially, especially places like Thyatira, because remember how I, how I described how things were with them in particular. You know, you had, you had a lot of people who are part of all of these different trades and they were and they were associated with these different trade guilds. Now the whole thing was that these trade guilds were associated with some sort of patron deity. So these guilds, you can think of them kind of as as unions, um, were very much closely connected to pagan worship, pagan festivals, you know, all sorts of things that were very much, very clearly anti-Christian. And people, if they wanted to be in the trade that they were in and therefore earn a living. And and they would it was very much to their best interest to be a part of this a part of these guilds, and if you were a part of these guilds, you had to participate in these things that gave homage to these to their patron deity. So if you're a Christian at that time, what are you going to do? Now you're wanting to be uh, faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, which means you can't participate in those sorts of things. And those people of the trade guilds are saying, well, okay, well then you are no longer a part of us. And now you've lost your job. So now, so now what do you do? You're, you don't have a trade now anymore, so you can't sell. And if you can't sell, you can't get money. If you can't get money, you can't 
buy things so that they can't buy or sell. Do you see do you see how do you see how this works here? This this is something that the first century audience you know, when they say, you know, so that you know anybody who doesn't understand the mark uh, won't be able to buy or sell. People who are hearing this in the first century would have said, yeah, I I understand exactly what that is. And especially in the people of Thyatira, they're saying, we're living that right now. That's what's going on at this very moment. The mark is there is is buying into the false religious system of whatever patron deity they would have been forced to serve and to worship and to give homage to and to work along those lines and to do the things that go against Christ and the things of Christ. The Christian tradesman is going to say, I can't do that. I can't take that quote unquote mark. They're already marked, by the way. They're already sealed by the Holy Spirit, which shows that they belong to him. And so naturally, going into those pagan, those, those pagan activities is something that they can't do. What's the result? Oh, you don't have a job now. So now you can't buy or sell. Folks, that... <laughs> And that's what's and do you, are we ones to believe that that's something that's not even happening today in other parts of the world? You might read of so many other Christians who are persecuted who are driven from their homes. What does that mean? They don't have a job, and naturally, eventually, they won't have money. What can't they do? They can't buy. They can't sell. And that's and the roots of that comes from their faith in Jesus Christ. That's how the persecution started, and they're driven from their homes. That's why you have different organizations and people like Voice of the Martyrs who ask for support and donations so that they can provide for these people who have lost everything. They've lost everything, you know, just, I mean, because of their faith in Christ. That's, that's, why, that's why they're in the predicament that they're in right now. So that's a reality even today. But it was a reality in the first century. In the first century, people would have understood that. They didn't understand the mark as, as, a, as a barcode or, or, or something like that or a chip. It's way over their heads. We're the ones who have gotten a little bit carried away with our understanding of this. Okay. And so they, and so they would say, yeah, that's, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm living with right now. And so do you understand, even when you take that into account, do you, do you, do you understand even further how... The words of verse 10 of Revelation chapter 13 is filled with a lot more, um, you know, just more impactful meaning. If anyone, um, um, excuse me, the end of verse 10, here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Yeah, this is something that's that's something that that people going through that whole thing would have been called to have to do. Endurance and faith of the saints. This calls for endurance and faith of the saints. That's 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 what you have there. So I hope you can see and I hope you're you're starting to understand a little bit from a first century perspective what this would have looked like. Now we're not done looking at this from the first century perspective. There's a lot there there's other things that go into it into this, especially as it relates to the number six hundred and sixty six. You ever wonder why that number is that number and why it shows up in Revelation that way? Now some people have their that have a theory or two as to what that is. I don't necessarily lean that way. I don't, I don't agree with that. Um, although I see where they're coming from, but I think, but I think that there's a particular way that we understand 666, 666, which again, I'm going to say pretty, pretty confidently, pretty boldly. The first century audience would have understood exactly what is meant by 666. They would know. Okay. And so what we're going to do next time is we're going to get into the mind of the first century audience to see things from their eyes so that we can have a greater understanding of what the mark of the beast is. And then we can ask the question, does this sort of thing say anything to us, even though this is something that would have been specifically understood by people of the first century? That's what we're going to start to that's what we're going to start to get into next time. So we're kind of halting here in the middle of our analysis here. Um, but, but bear with us here. And, and, when, and, and also next time when we end chapter 13, is, and I guess as we kind of maybe we'll kind of preview uh, chapter 14, we'll kind of get into, the, into, into answering the question, so what? 
so what with this whole thing of 666 and what that represents? There is an actual specific representation connected to the number 666. Again, we'll talk about that. But again, we can ask the question, so what? So what for the first century audience? So what for us today and for other Christians to follow after us? So what? There's a very important answer to that question. And I don't want you to miss that. So again, we'll leave it there. We'll leave it hanging here. And like I said, we're stopping in the middle of our, our of our analysis and we'll pick things up in the middle of, of verse 17 next time. So I hope things are starting to get a little bit clearer for you. Um, and we'll bring that clarity to completion hopefully next time. So we'll leave it there for now. If you if you um, if you enjoy the show and you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to subscribe to my show on um, on Apple Podcasts, also on iHeartRadio, YouTube, uh, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also follow me, Steve Gill, on Twitter. My handle is at LT Scripts. That's L T S C R I P T S which stands for Loving the Scriptures. And don't forget to order a copy of my book, Signs of the End, What Did Jesus Say About His Own Return and the and the Events That Point to It. Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com is where you can get those. Okay, so I enjoyed just dipping our toe into this whole thing here. And again, we'll bring this to completion next time. I hope it's brought clarity to you as well. Um, and I would invite you to come back and, and, and finish off chapter 13 with me um, so we can get the fuller picture there. Okay, well, my name is Steve Gill, and I will see you right back here next time.